So I'm going to start by reading a little bit from the Popol Vuh. Popol Vuh is the ancient kind of book of creation from Guatemala, or what's now Guatemala, who its authors were are unknown. <clears throat> you know, in the mid-1500s, a what they called a, a reading of it was done from the original text. And that was written in Quiche, one of the Mayan dialect. And then that was translated into Spanish. But it made more clear later that that was just a reading. The original book would have been a book of symbols and could have been read in perhaps dozens of different ways. So what we have a, a reading done by one of the last people who could read it, the original, or interpret the meaning. And then we have a translation into Spanish and then into English. So at Point Loma, or connected to Point Loma, and from England, Philip Malpas made a translation from the French translation into English at one point. So he says, uh, this is the beginning of chapter one. This is the first book written in times of old, but it is hidden from the sight of him who sees and thinks. Admirable is its appearance and the recital that, make, that it makes of the time in which everything that is in heaven and earth was formed. The quadrature and the quadrangulation of their signs, the measure of their angles, their alignment, the establishment of parallels in heaven and on earth at the four extremities. At the four cardinal points, according to the word of the creator and the fashioner, the mother, the father of life, of existence, by him through whom all acts and breathes, father and vivifier of the peace of nations, of his civilized vassals, whose wisdom has meditated the excellence of all that exists in heaven, on the earth, in the lakes, and in the sea. So this is the feeling of the Popol Vuh, and one can see in this a number of things that have some similarities and parallels with what you find in Blavatsky's Stanzas of Tian. And then the whole Popol Vuh is extremely complex and symbolic and, and not what I'm going to be talking about directly. But it sort of gives the kind of framework for the context, the context of uh, this uh, friend and mentor of mine. So I put his name here, uh, Victor Manuel Tescasi. Tescasi is his, from his mother's side, the Lacandon Mayan name from Chiapas. So he's an unusual character. He's an herbalist, an extraordinary uh, knowledge of healing and herbal medicine. Maybe more than 4,000 herbal remedies just off the top of his head. He knows the whole, whole Mesoamerican herbal tradition from north to south is part of his, his uh, life livelihood. He's here, he has a little herb shop. So when I first met him, he was a neighbor of a friend of mine in Tijuana, business neighbor. A friend of mine had a stationery store, was connected to some yoga centers there, and, and Victor was next door in a herb shop. Uh, at that time, he was very reticent but my friend Marco said, you know, I think this person has more knowledge than just about herbs, so I will keep in touch and I'll tell you if he, you know, starts making more available what he knows about. We were quite sure, and then I met him one day, and I think, yeah, I think you're right, you know, I think this is something different than the usual. So, <clears throat> at that point in time, he, a number of things happened. One is that he had a fire in his house, 
and uh, some very significant things from his family tradition were lost in that fire. These were especially from his mother's tradition. So that precipitated in, in, in him the need to then share these things that he knew more. Uh, additionally, uh, another unusual event happened uh, where it's kind of a, a curious story. Uh, anyway, he was uh, put in a position by a very uh, odd character, a woman that had known him elsewhere in Mexico to uh, participate in helping the healing of a young boy who had cancer. Essentially, to make the story short, she was a rather uh, unscrupulous person in a way, but she did have some healing abilities, but she would often uh, get involved with, over her head, for, you know, in a, in a sense misusing her power and uh, to gain money or position like that. So she had gotten in a way over her head with this uh, very wealthy family with a young boy who had a very serious illness. And then she went to uh, Victor, Don Victor, and asked him to bail her out, essentially. And he said no, <laughs> initially. And then she begged him because she said, if you don't, she, I will get in trouble, meaning her, because the boy will probably die and it'll be your fault. And he said, no. He still said no. Uh, and he said, besides, there would have to be a third person in the equation that we all know to witness this, and there isn't. Well, she happened to know my friend who had this door next door, and then she recount, re, you know, said back to him, yes, there is someone, Marco, and you have to do it. So he relented and uh, provided the herbs and mediation necessary for the young boy on the condition that she never do this again, get involved in something for wrong motivations. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so at that point, he then became more public in his teaching of more hidden side of his tradition. So in his mother's tradition, Lacan Don Mayan, very small Mayan group, very few people left in the, their original state in the jungles of Chiapas. In his lineage, uh, he said, she said, the story is that they came by boat, large dragon-headed boats that could carry a thousand people more than the reign of a hundred kings ago when she was alive. So, Somewhere around uh, four to 8,000 BC is when he says they migrated from Asia. This doesn't fit the usual Bering Strait idea of people walking slowly, and gradually getting around the continents, you know. It fits more some of our theosophical ideas. He also said that it happened at a time when there was a great war in Asia it happened at a time when there was a lot of uh, geological disruption, earthquakes and things. And that in the myths and stories of their original place in Asia, which he doesn't quite give a clear location, he might generically say India or Mongolia, but I don't think he's giving a clear geographic idea of these places. He says that there was a large underground temples, pyramids underground, that were then collapsed and closed during these great earthquakes. It might have even been longer ago than 5,000 BC, but it fits the stories of, in the Puranas and things of the Great War in Asia and the Puranas. And some of the names in his family also reflect this even to this day. One of the common names amongst the even on his father's side, his father is Yaki Indian, uh, is Muni. So Muni, like Shakyamuni, the Buddha's name. Very common name amongst Yakis. It's not a, uh, it shows up later in his linguistics also in his, from his mother's tradition. For example, the name for the son is Kuria. 
Well, in Sanskrit, it's Surya. There are a number of other words I shared with uh, a Vedic scholar, Subhash Kak, and he said there was quite a lot there to indicate some ancient Indian Prakritic uh, synonyms amongst the number of basic words like numbers and things like that. Oh, now I know why no one knows how this works. Oh, there we go. Here he is outside in his uh, garden, some, wrapping some sage and making some things. So, could, his lifespan, so Manuel, uh, or Victor, was born in 1914. His father was born in about between the 1840s. His grandfather was born in the late 1700s. So when I think at times he would talk as if before conquest was the other day, uh, for him it was. It's a different perspective, not only in himself, but just in his age, you know. When he was born, he was born in a place called Umbadero Canyon uh, near Yaki River in, in Sonora. And he was born as native people were before any of the conquest. This would have been a very uh, isolated, small group living on the land very directly, very simply. Uh, growing the ancient native corn and beans from their tradition and, you know, very, very, very different world, completely a world long gone for the most part. So he comes from a different realm in a sense. He's something from the past. At the same time carries to the future. So he's holding ideas and views and traditions that are long lost. It's like a, a living, uh, living archeological being. So in that world, you know, it's oral tradition. He's learning all these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uses of plants from his parents. Not only learning them conceptually, but experientially. You know, in those ways of growing up, they would ask the child, you know, are they growing older? You know, if you want to know an herb, okay. Go sit with the plant for the day. So then they go off and you would take the time and you would sit with the plant, you would observe it and feel it and taste it and be with it and you would get to know things in this very direct, very uh, nature-oriented manner. Oh, he's playing a little flute there. So, let me think, this is uh, This photo was taken two years ago, I think, and uh, believe it or not, he's 97 years old there. Should skip ahead here. Oh, there's me. That's a, so you can see that's like uh, oh, maybe uh, 15 years ago. <laughs> now I keep thinking, how come he stays the same and I keep getting older? <laughs> About that time, we, it was a funny little thing. We went to visit my father, who was then. Uh, uh, about 96-ish, uh, 97 maybe, and we were having lunch with Marco and, and Victor and myself, and, and, and I don't think he quite realized the age of my father, so then he was saying, oh yes, he was at that time 85, and my father looked at him, in, or 84 maybe, something like that, and my father said, oh, a young man. <laughs> anyway, we all laughed, it was quite, quite funny. 
That's him younger, so you can see he's in a different world. This is him at age 25. Oh, is it back? Yes, in better shape at that time. <laughs> a few moves later. Yeah. So, of course, there's all kinds of horrific things happen to Native peoples in the North America and in Mexico, uh, and especially the Yaqui Indians. He's half Yaqui on his father's side again, and half Lacandon Mayan on his mother's side. Um, so it's north and south of Mexico in one person, in a sense. So during that early time, uh, the Yaqui Indians were all rounded up in Sonora and taken as to be both incarcerated and as slave labor to Chiapas. So when his father was taken at that time, probably around 1910, uh, that's how he, his father met his mother. His father also, I believe, had a, a family before that as well. His father was uh, probably 70s at that time. So a lot of disruptions took place in Mexico. So this is Cachora, and I mean, uh, Cachora is one of his names. Uh, Victor and is uh, about age 25, I think. So from his mother's tradition, <coughs> Some of this he mixes together. He makes it clear that in ancient Mexico, you have, for example, the name of the plumed serpent. So the plumed serpent is, we know the name in, in Nahuatl is Quetzalcoatl, plumed serpent, or the name in other Mayan is Cucumatz or Cuculcan. So the plumed serpent is, uh, those are different words for the same idea. So he makes it clear that pre-conquest in Mesoamerica had one religion, just like he said you and Europe have different languages and you use the word for God or whatever in different languages. This is not really recognized very well today by anthropologists. We don't really, we see this tribe or that tribe or that tribe. He said, no, no, that's not correct. Ancient Mesoamerica had one, one religion. He gives the example of the plumed serpent. So for him, you know, usually again in if you look up Plumed Serpent or Quetzalcoatl, then they talk about, oh, the, some idea that this fit the myth of the white man coming from Europe and kind of it's made into a very historic kind of figure or symbolic, but the meaning isn't very given with, with much depth. So here are some different symbols. Really, the, the main symbol we're looking at are these little geometrical symbols in the corner. This is very simple. So this, uh, the glyph is just kind of an artistic presentation. But the symbol is a very sim simplified or uh, essentialized symbol. So this is what he calls uh, chakalikto. Chakalikto is the water of life. I mean, it looks like waves. But of course, this is only reflected in water. For him, it's a cosmic principle. It's the balancing, nourishing element. So in the system, he talks about, interestingly, three universal forces. I don't know, I could write them. Maybe I should write. So these three universal forces, one is called uh, Chamawa, one is called Chakalikto, and one is called Nagual. So some, these are using, um, this is not Lacandon, this is using uh, words from the more commonly used Nahuatl language. So Chamawa is like the universal spirit, creative force. Chakalikto is the uh, nourishing water balancer of life, and the Nagual is the uh, 
kind of uh, literally the, 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 the devour, devouring and regenerating force. So these three forces correlate rather remarkably well with the three forces in Indian thought of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. The creator, <coughs> preserver, and destroyer. Additionally, and I don't have a photo, he, there's a concept uh, of uh, an image of a person dancing, one foot up, holding a gourd in that tradition. It's called Chin Chin Nimple. It has the exact same meaning as dancing Shiva. When, he, he, when I show, showed him once an image of a dancing Shiva, he was quite surprised. He goes, oh, that's the same. He finds the universal nature of these ideas very interesting, especially from uh, Buddhism and Hinduism. This one is kind of simply drawn. It's a very curious idea he has, but he gives it a, a um, um, Mexican uh, linguistic word. He has, there's other words in his language. He calls it an analogo interno, the internal analog. So in the symbol, as it is, it has kind of a, it, it's really about the, the upper, does this point at things? Green button. The green button? Yeah, on the top. Above the arrows. Ah. Okay, so this is, as he describes it, this is coming out of the creative chamawa energies, then manifest through these emanational spheres into manifestation. It's almost like a yin yang kind of symbol. And then this is the path through the levels of emanation to ascend to this source. And we have three dots. Uh, and then in the way he understands symbolism, they always are kind of obscuring or hiding things. So when you see three things, uh, it means there are always one, two, three, four things around it, even though there's nothing there. So actually, there are seven. So he says there are seven levels to ascending to this cosmic source, and this is the path of entering that. Sound familiar? Very amazing. There are very few world systems using systems of seven. You don't find that very often. Even though Blavatsky finds some, it's, it's rarely found, almost never found in Buddhism, for example. Um, Another idea in his understanding is what he calls the point of convergence. The point of convergence is where this, uh, this consciousness enters the spiritual consciousness. He associates this point of convergence with the, the third eye, with the pineal. Here are our figures again. So this is Chacalito. This one is called Mescalito. Creates this one together. It's another. Oh, it's just these are just images that were drawn. You know, just ideas. But he he drew these, and then I had them drawn for him. So here is a history from 1825 to 1925. Can anyone read this? <laughs> if you get close, you can see a little, what's interesting here? Well, there's all kinds of interesting, like there's a little sun. Does it read left to right? Or? See, that's the first question. I, you should have been there when I asked him that. Uh, I'll go to the, so I'll answer that in a second. 
in, with the next one. So this was, this is his uh, father's pictographic language. This, uh, he wasn't, he's not so fluent in this. It took him a while to write this, because he said, well, come back, I'll write something. Uh, but it, it, is, it can be read, he can read this. And this is an actual uh, history of events. I think there's some, what can I find in there? Some interesting little, anyway, he can read this as a series of events from, on one level from 1825 to Yeah, okay, John's ahead of us. We'll get, and this is just an example I took out of an old magazine. There's a stone up in Hemet, uh, which uh, has this mandala kind of effect and was always considered to have be similar to something found in Tibet or Asia. Again, in, in, again in, in, in Don Victor's tradition, there was a lot of movement back and forth. Not only did there, was there this enormous migration once from Asia of tens of thousands of people in enormous boats, but then some people went back. Well, he's never read the, the Puranic history, which says the same thing, that people also returned. Of course, this is prehistory. Not, you know, this is probably five to 10,000 BC. So here's some symbol writing on Sentinel Rock near Tucson. But I put this in here because this is out of the Century Path. It published at Point Loma and printed there in 1903. Probably by uh, Charles Ryan, probably wrote this. Now, if this I haven't shown this to him, but I'm sure Kachor or, or Victor could read this to us. So this is the more interesting writing. This is from his mother's Lacandon tradition. So this is where I asked him the question that Nicholas just asked. Uh, is it read from left to right, or how do you read this? And the answer was very disturbing. He said, read it any way you like. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, yeah, you can read left to right, or you can read right to left. You can read top to bottom. And then he also said you can read it, if you look at it, he was kind of pressing me, you'll see a pattern and you can read it that way as well. well I'm, I don't claim to have gotten that far at all. It's really quite... Yeah. There may be some kind of serpentine... I'm not sure. There are all these dots. Dots, are they directional dots? Well, apparently there are dots the other way. So is it going this way, this way, this way, this way? I'm not sure. Can you give a clue, is it ideas or time or? Where are those signally lines at the bottom showing how to read it when you follow those maps? <laughs> uh, possibly, yeah. This is uh, his signature. Uh, so this, he says, can be read not only in different directions, but also on different levels. So on one level, this is the story of migration of his mother's ancestors from Asia to Mexico, to Mesoamerica. But he says on another level, it will be uh, a more cosmological story. So this, and he writes this, as quickly as anyone here writes their own language or as quick, fast as anyone would write shorthand. I've seen him write, use this for taking notes and things. And I, he tried to explain it one day to us and it was very complicated. I didn't quite get it. So there must be others who can still read it and write it besides him? Um, possibly. Possibly not also. 
maybe there's that 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 branch of the family I've never I've not had contact with. He had one older sister who died about I don't know six years ago, who would have been fluent in this as well. She was probably uh, in her I don't know 105, 110, somewhere in there. How it got passed on on that side of the family, I'm not sure. But each of these, I do know this much, each of these little symbol ideographs have symbolic meaning and phonetic meaning both simultaneously. This is very unusual also, but some languages go in that direction. But I'm quite sure from, I've seen other things he's written, that this is how, not necessarily these same Kind, these same images, but this is how the Popol Vuh was written. So the Popol Vuh was written in a way where it could be read in multiple directions and with multiple layers of meaning simultaneously. So that's why we have one reading of Popol Vuh. It's very, again, not the same, but I would say very somewhat parallel and closer to the source language of Senzar that Blavatsky talks about. This is not that, but it's cl going close to that direction, certainly in the way it's composed and the way it's put together. What are the so-called experts, if you've talked to any, do they recognize? I haven't found any expert that will look at it. I've tried. It's a bit of a upset. It's sort of like finding someone in uh, modern Egypt that can read and write hieroglyphics. They're not supposed to be there. I have to test him out. You know, I'm always curious. I did. Um, Can everyone see? This is old style Chinese, primitive Chinese, earliest. This is Shang, Shang Dynasty Chinese. So the, the images are, are quite simple. But still, what do they mean? If I look at them, I can kind of, uh, I don't know. Well, I showed, I showed him some Shang Dynasty inscriptions that had been translated. And uh, he could read them easily. It was really quite interesting. It was very interesting. Yeah, they were different. They're different. But between his father's language and this one, he could read them. Yeah, it was very uh, kind of my little, like, he says this came from Asia, but is this just a tradition or is it really some kind of common root? So definitely there's some kind of common root there. So this, I think, did we... Uh, so this, we go back to the, this is what he refers to as his signature. He always signs everything with these, he has a kind of cute way of drawing them, but of course these are, these are not birds, these are supposed to be snakes. These are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So he has these seven, these seven manifest, again, these, and then he has this three dots. These are the, this is some multiple la layers of symbology. This is the seven levels of creation to him. And also the, these are symbolic of the planets as well. And these seven serpents are in the idea of this universal spirit essence he calls Chamawa. The seven serpents are the, they call the, the umbral. The umbral meaning like the, it's like the, the covering. And you have to pass through these to, to uh, attain liberation or, or realization of some kind. So the person who passes through these, they consider, you know, is, is part of the, the work uh, through various meditative and other practices. 
you pass through these, these seven. And then I found this years after meeting him. This is drawn in a piece of art. It's in the Archaeological Museum in Mexico City. It was drawn in the late 1500s. So it's the interlacing serpents, even with this kind of circle here. Oh yeah, we did that. So we can see. Oh, and then what do we have here, of course? is uh, both Celtic and from Buddhist tradition, the knot of eternity. When showing, again, Victor, these images, he just said, oh, this is the same. It's universal. He said these were all the same meaning. It's not of eternity. Here he's a kind of mandala. Again, he has layers of meaning here. I don't pretend to understand it uh, completely at all. So here is again this these seven serpents. Here is humanity. Here is variously uh, a comet. Or is it, you know, literally a comet? But then, the next time you may, I may ask him something, then it will slightly change. Things aren't codified in like rigid structures exactly. It, it has layers and layers of meaning. It may mean cometary matter, even emanating, in our theosophic sense. Here is um, what he calls mescalito. But mescalito is sometimes identified with the the uh, desert um, peyote plant used in ceremonies in Mexico for its purposes. But actually, it's the other way around. He also, he says mescalito is a universal principle that manifests in a number of different places and ways in the world. So they associate mescalito with um, compassion and joy and happiness. And they identify that with the animal, the deer, and the food, plant, corn, and then the sacred uh, cactus, peyote. But the principle is what's important. The principle, these things are named after this cosmic principle, not the other way around. This is the what he calls the sacred, sacred triangle. So he said in his mother's tradition, this is from Lacandon tradition, they would paint these or weave them and put them in caves and they would hold them up there as focus for concentration. At the same time, it also has symbolic meaning with each of the colors, the prismatic colors. Uh, there's supposed to be seven. I don't think we have it right. I'm not sure. The triangle in the center. This is the source, again, the universal source, Chomawa, the universal spirit, emanating these seven forces. It's through the central triangle, you enter the path to the infinite. He always talks about the path to the infinite. The central triangle is a pyramid. Yes, pyramid. Pyramid's very sacred. The pyramid is the, from the, again, the, the, his Asian ancestors lived in pyramids in Asia. I don't know what that means. Apparently there's some pyramids yet to be found. I guess there's some small ones in China. You may relate. Any yeah. points to, uh, to this photo? <laughs> <laughs> Just compare that uh, photo with yeah, exactly. The middle part of this world. Mm. These are pretty fancy. Does he have a website or somebody help him? I did these. Yeah, these are not online yet too much. See, it's been a kind of a... How to explain it? You know, 
he's very reticent, even though he's become more public. And so coming from a tradition where things were kept very secretly to preserve them, then slowly offering some things outside of the family lineage that comes at a kind of risk. Uh, so he's been rather reticent and things, some things have gone well and some things haven't, I think, in that way. Uh, they, it's kind of a long lineage in the past, you know, carrying forth this small thread to the future. Yeah. This is pretty reminiscent of the, uh, of the so-called temple in Jinsai. Yeah. Where it has a solar pyramid on the outside and on the inside. Wait, wait, you get to talk the, the microphone. So Chichen Itza, John was saying there's the, the solar pyramid and inside is the lunar pyramid. It's a lunar pyramid, a pyramid inside. So it Chichen Itza, the uh, big pyramid, the one that the serpent goes down on the, on the uh, equinoxes, I guess. Uh, there is a pyramid inside the big pyramid. You go in underneath the steps, underneath the staircase, and there's a long kind of steep staircase goes up into the center of it and is climbing up uh, on an internal pyramid that's built, the other one is built over it. And they, they call that the lunar pyramid now, but it has this long staircase and at the top there's a chalk mool uh, sitting on a jaguar couch. Oh yeah, uh, and uh, that's kind of like the pathway to the infinite. It's very, very yeah. The chakmul chakmul is very similar to ch chakalikto chakmul. Uh -huh. Same root has uh -huh. to do with this water energy and the symbology. Right. The jaguars and passing yeah. through to the infinite. That, that's no longer open to the public, so you can't right. get in there anymore. Yeah, well, maybe you could. I don't know. Uh, yeah. John, are there books about that so that we all can read that? <laughs> if you read Spanish, uh, there is. Okay. Uh, yeah. So yes, you can, you can get books on it. There's probably pictures on it as well, but you're going to have to find them in Mexico. There's a very good, uh, the, the, one of the newest translations of the Popol Vuh is by Dennis Tedlock. It's really, really very good translation of the Popol Vuh because Tedlock, instead of, uh, what could you say, being the distant scholar and just learning the language and translating, actually lived in Guatemala and studied with uh, Mayan, what they call day keepers, uh, and was introduced from even how it's done today to the meanings of some of the symbolic understandings of the contents he would read to his Mayan counterparts uh, from the, what we have, this rendering of the Popol Vuh. Uh, the same with uh, Don Victor. He, you know, he knows, I, I tell him about the Popol Vuh, or I ask him questions. He knows the symbology of these things in tremendous depth. But as in any tradition, they're really, uh, he's a tough taskmaster because you say, oh, he, it's not so simple. In one way, we have we, we have a very uh, nice and very uh, uh, what can we say easily accessible tradition. In his tradition, for you to go to the next step, it's presented and you get to figure it out. You're not told necessarily what it means. Even if you don't have the ability to directly penetrate the meaning, that you get stuck. That's that's it. That's your that's where you stop. It's a very uh, demanding tradition in one way. But that's how it was done in ancient times, so they think, why should they change? You know, it's like this very rigorous in one way, in, in many respects. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Is there a reason why yellow and orange are switched? No, that's probably a mistake. No. This is not perfect. You know, using graphic design people and stuff. It should be the prismatic colors in order. Yeah. <laughs> and each has meaning. Each corresponds also in his system to uh, 
elements in the body and principles and and also uh, planets. Uh, one other curious thing about his mother's tradition is the name, the name of the ancestors from Asia uh, were called the Oms, O-M-Z. He insists that, and, and they would uh, use the word also as a mantra, but he insists that O-M without the Z is incorrect. That was quite curious. It has to have a Z after it. Because Z is the life force. The Z sound. So the Om's Z is the life force. Well, I checked with my, uh, my Kurdish friend, Ali Ashuri, and Z is the life force in linguistically throughout Central Asian languages. Yeah, he gave me several examples from Kurdish and other languages. Yes. Question? What about the record of the people themselves? I mean, uh, we have heard that they were unusual, these Lakadon people uh, with very light eyes and light uh, hair. This is the legend. Is that true? Did he tell you that from uh, when, you spoke think, with, when you spoke with him? Did he describe the people of his ancestors, of his mothers? Again, I, uh, I showed a picture of him once to my friend. The Tibetan doctor's wife is from Mongolia. And she was so startled because she says he looks exactly like her uncle. I mean, really, she was quite taken aback. So I think in his tradition, there's definitely a uh, whatever you want to call Mongolian connection, wherever Mongolians were in Asia 5000 BC, which is, uh, could have been probably anywhere. Um, I don't. I think that other legend came. Uh, Le Plongeon wrote the the what's it called the Mayan what's it called the book late last century. I think some of those ideas may have been exaggerated, quite honestly, uh, and a misunderstanding of the meaning of the Quetzalcoatl myth, talking about the light-skinned white person. But these were symbolic statements. These were not literal statements. Well, what is the function of the plumed serpent? Mike, Mike. When you showed the uh, diagrams, what is the plumed serpent in relation to these cosmological symbols? Is he a creator? Or is he a, what is he? Or well, she? I think the, this is the plumed serpent. There is a plumed, there's a more complex symbol. I don't have a photo here. It's called Anawika. So Anawika has, it's again the cosmos. Um, so it's not an entity, really. No, no, no. So Anawika is a cosmic principle. It's the so you have the it's like the the uh, the structure of the cosmos would be the serpent, and the feathers of the cosmos with the with the colors would be the emanations of the energies. So this is the more deeper meaning of the plumed serpent idea. He thinks he just kind of erases. He gets he is not. Uh, these ideas, more concrete ideas, he says, no, 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 this is not right. This is, these are, it's the other way around. We have it all backwards, pretty much, which makes sense because we're just going from the fragments of anthropology and archaeology trying to piece things together, so it's not the whole picture. Could I ask, uh, again, uh, you mentioned, you said that he's able to read the kanji or the characters of Chinese without any problem. The early primitive Shang Dynasty ones, yeah. But not, you didn't try the more recent ones? It's not so obvious. No, that's, that's not probably... But, but he's able to read those without any problem, the yeah. earlier ones? Mm -hmm. yep. I think that's very, very significant. That yeah. He had no training in Chinese otherwise, etc. No, no. And he's never been to China? Obviously not. That's no. very significant, I think. No, he didn't. Uh, I don't think he started writing in Spanish till he was in his 70s. He taught himself. I mean, Spanish is his maybe fourth language. 
Also, he makes it clear there's a kind of the bodhisattva element in a very pragmatic sort of way in his lineage, because he comes from a healing tradition where you're supposed, you know, he says, he says basically, simply he puts it, if you don't heal others, you cannot attain the path to the infinite, period. You have to be able, you have to have the capacity to, to heal others. And he, in their tradition, is very concrete about that. It's very, you know, you really have to have some ability there, and whatever, whatever your gift is. Uh, I did take him uh, twice. He went. We went to Los Angeles in the late 1990s, 2000, to when the Dalai Lama was there for the music festival, and uh, they had a a special um, meeting of native elders with the Dalai Lama, and uh, and he appreciated Dalai Lama very much. He called him the Grand Nagual, you know, the great. Uh, the great master, but he's very disturbed by the politics around it all. He didn't like that. I mean, he didn't, no one told him anything. He didn't, just observed it. And then he also did found, he felt that uh, he liked all the teachings. They had uh, translation to Spanish so he could listen to everything. He said that was all wonderful, but there wasn't enough emphasis on preserving and sustaining Mother Earth. He thought they were lacking there. There should be much more emphasis on the sustaining and the plants and the earth, because without that, nothing would exist. So he was kind of, and he said he, he, he told his criticism to the Dalai Lama directly. It was kind of funny. What was the reaction? Yeah, Dalai Lama was very gracious and they had a great connection. He liked it, yeah. Anything, question, question? Yeah, mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw him, uh, 99th birthday last uh, January. He said uh, that last year was his big obstacle year. If he made it to 99, then he thought he'd be good for 12 more. Uh, he also has one, uh, one uh, prophecy. Well, he doesn't use that word necessarily, because he also, he knows um, his, uh, from his Lacandon tradition, uh, astrological system, but he says there's a great uh, obstacle problem coming globally around um, 2024, as it gets closer. April 2024, he says there will be several days with no sun. So I don't know, I asked him more what that means or the cause, and he's not 100% sure. But he said people need to be prepared for that. Some cycle change. Also about the Mayan calendar and all those things. Uh, he wasn't quite so blunt to say that all the stuff was total nonsense, but basically he said they have the dates wrong and that it's not the end of the long count. And that actually he said the end of the long count is the opening of a new cycle and everything will gradually get better after that. He said the whole, the whole, uh, the, what do you call it, the whole excitement and stuff that it's the end of something and that the, all these things, he says, isn't, is not the correct viewpoint at all. Yeah, it's a huge, uh, just a very, just a cycle change. Ken? Ken? Yeah. Um, can you please repeat uh, what you said, when uh, did they come from Asia? Well, his mother's tradition said the reign of 100 kings ago. So how long does a king reign? I asked him that. I said, is a king's reign uh, 50 years? He said, no more, 100. So it's a symbolic way of speaking. So I was guessing, you know, something like uh, five to 10,000 years ago, seven, 8,000 years ago. Does he have, did he ever mention, uh, did they go back? Yes, some went back. The, and, and then, Came, uh, some of them went back, or what happened? Some returned to Asia. It's also that story in the Puranas as well. Uh, and um, do they have any any um, uh, ceremony or ritual where they communicate, uh, like the ones here with the ones there, through? Did you ever hear about this? Oh, not not direct, not exactly. No. Okay. I think, no. Just. Thank More you. question? No. no.
he's passing it on to some near 60 year old man or something like that. Yeah, I think both his, uh, I, he's, I mean, I've known him a long time in one way, but he's still very secretive character. Um, but I think there are, they're different, it's a vast tradition, really. It's a whole lineage. So different people have different pieces. I know that much. And then also his sister had a lot of students in a different part of Mexico. She was older. And basically, I think, given the disruption in his life earlier, their mentor was not his, his first his mother, but then his mother uh, died uh, at one point. Uh, it was his, grand, her, his, her, his mother's father, his grandfather there, uh, transmitted the writing system and all things in, in more depth to it all. So there's a whole a number of people that came out of that as well. Uh, he's can be quite a humorous person. Like one time, uh, a guy came down to see him who had been studying in the uh, popularized uh, Carlos Castaneda kind of realm. A very nice guy he came down with another uh, Buddhist friend of mine. He thought because he was this fellow was Mexican American, he should meet uh, Don Victor. So we got there, and this fellow was going on and on and on about you know all the energy of the mountain and the, this and that and da da da. And, and then and Don Victor was very quiet and very polite, and and then he said, uh, and, and what do you call these things? And, and he's talking about spirits and things. And, and then he used in Spanish the uh, parapsychological phenomena, you know, phenomena parapsychologico. What could, you know, Victor had never heard those words in Spanish before. He said, como? What? He said, oh, these are like, you know, parapsychological phenomena. He said, oh, he's like, he's very polite. And then they, then they left and I saw him after that. And I said, what did you think about, uh, uh, Luis coming and asking these t comments and all these things and all this stuff and going on and on about phenomena, you know. What did you think of him? He said, he said oh, he was a parapsychological phenomenon, you know. <laughs> and that kind of finished it off, you know. Question? Comment? <laughs> 